Hello, it's Liz. Um, today, right now, in this video, I'm doing something that I wasn't ever going to do on this channel. But um, one of my, one of the first YouTubers I ever really followed, Cat Black, recently made a video about why she's an atheist. And toward the end of the video, she said that she was, she wanted to hear from her followers who were theists of one kind or another and hear their stories of why they believe in God. So there was a lot of, you know, content in the video and like stuff that I could respond to or um, that I have thoughts or objections or whatever, but I'm not going to address any of that in this video. I'm just going to respond to that prompt for my own story. Um, so yeah, here it goes. Oh. So the simplest answer to that question of, you know, why do I believe in God or like, how did I come to believe in God? is that it's it's something that happened when I was pretty young. For some background, I was raised in a secular family. So very different from Kat's family, um, which was very, I mean, it sounded kind of fundamentalist Christian, um, you know, very, um, very into evangelism and proselytization because she talked about you know, being kind of made to proselytize when she was young, going to these very conservative Christian schools. So yeah, that was like not my experience at all. I mean, first of all, I mean, my parents are both lapsed Catholics, basically. Sorry, I'm having some breathing issues today. I just, I have allergies all the time. You know, um, maybe I can start a Patreon and people can pay for my allergy medication. Oh. Anyway, yeah, like my most of my ancestors going back pretty far were not Protestants. Um, so, I mean, most of them were Catholics. Um, there's one sort of corner of my family that is very like European Protestant, even a little waspy. Um, but that's the culturally and like personally that's the part of my family that i feel the least connected to that i feel like i'm not very much like them and i don't i don't really relate to a lot of their values and personality traits you know and stuff but most of my family uh you know of, of various ethnicities like mostly irish scottish and mexican all of them were catholics um by, and by all of them, I mean, you know, whatever, three quarters of them. So I think that's important. I think that's important to note because Protestant ways of viewing the world and especially of viewing God are very much seen as the default here in the U.S. And when it comes to a lot of atheists talking about their, you know, feelings of being repelled by Christianity and by theists, they're mostly responding to a kind of a very specific kind of Christian. And they, they, they're generalizing, they're overgeneralizing. And it's really easy, especially when you hear, you know, a certain framework in which like a bunch of specific ideas and words are used, like God and sin and Jesus. It's hard to let go of the connotations that like, and the framework that you were originally given all that stuff in, when you hear those words, you're going to think about that framework and that way of thinking and that worldview that you associate with those words, right? So for me, like the framework that I had to work with was, was somewhat different. Um, both of my parents though had very bad experiences with Catholicism of one kind or another. Um, into varying degrees. Um, I think both of them still had some kind of respect for it, but they just couldn't do it. Um, 
based on their experiences, especially when it came to, I mean, I think, I think both of them told me stories about like mean nuns and just like a very sort of punishment based way of doing things and seeing things. And that that's part of what turned them off that, and you know, aspects of dogmatism and literalism, which definitely, I think all of that is in sort of mainstream Protestantism too. So <sighs> stupid lungs. So yeah, so they raised me secular. I was raised secular. Um, I think, I mean, both of my parents kind of raised me with some kind of, I guess, openness to the possibility of divinity, but they were very, um, very much did not raise me. I remember when I was a kid saying the Pledge of Allegiance and there was a lot I didn't understand about it, but I really didn't understand the under God thing. Like, cause I didn't understand what God or who God was. Like, I just didn't, I didn't understand what it was I was supposed to be saying or promising or something, pledging. It just didn't mean anything to me. And so I was annoyed that I was being made to say it. Um, who's at the door? Okay, sorry, just a sec. Okay, I'm, I'm back. It was just the mailman. So what was I talking about? Yeah, just like the concepts behind God and, and Jesus and sin and like all of, all of those things that I just said were not things that I understood. I wasn't taught about them. So, and just the whole world of like going to church and all of that was alien to me. So I had very much an outsider perspective and, you know, I certainly wasn't really that interested in it. It didn't, it didn't hold, that's definitely the, the Christianity I was exposed to was not what brought me to believe in God. What got me, what brought me to believe in God was the fact that <laughs> I was a, you know, weird autistic kid and I was obsessed with math and I still am and now I have a degree in it. Um, but I was, I was really just, and still am really passionate about math and I thought about it a lot and I would, you know, do these personal kind of explorations of like patterns and, you know, looking at and thinking about, you know, just, just how math operates. And, and one day, I must have been, I mean, somewhere between maybe 11 and 14. I'm not sure how old I was, but somewhere in there, I was just thinking about math <laughs> and how beautiful it was and how, how math itself, math is really a particular expression of logic. I, I, I didn't know exactly how to articulate these thoughts at the time, but this was basically what I was thinking, um, was that the, you know, the underpinnings of what, how math works and why math works is this ineffable logic that just is, it's not something that humans created. I mean, humans, like the way that mathematical systems work, um, Basically, humans create a number of parameters. So the way that most people think about math and the way that most, um, the math that you learn in school, if you're not going to major in math in college and stuff, the math that you learn in school is all based around a particular mathematical system of which there are actually just like infinite. <laughs> but, but we always focus on one, which is like, basically systems using the real numbers and using some specific operations such as addition and multiplication, et cetera. Um, that's kind of the standard. That's a default that we use in our, in our culture. Again, this is also like culturally specific there. Well, I, I can't get into it. Anyway, math is amazing. Um, but the mathematical system we use 
is based on a number of inputs. Like we say, okay, we're going to use the real number system, which is like, you know, everything from the counting numbers to, you know, fractions, stuff that can be ex expressed as fractions, um, also called the rational numbers, as well as all the weird stuff in between on the number line called the irrational numbers. So that's the reals and, you know, all the negatives and stuff. So we work with the, with the real numbers and they might mention, you know, the imaginary numbers at some point, but they probably won't really get into it. So it's, we're going to input that number system and we're going to input these operations that we've defined. And then we're just kind of see what happens, right? Um, this is maybe less obvious because it just seems like because it's the default, it's not something that, that most people are gonna think about. They just think that's what math is. But actually, that's a very specific expression of what math can be. You can put any number of inputs and it doesn't even have to be numbers. It doesn't have to be a number system. It doesn't have to be the operations that you know. Um, the operations can be all kinds of things. I, I wouldn't say anything. There are some limits on how you can define operations and how you can put together a system but there's infinite varieties like and you can use you can use colors instead of numbers you can use letters instead of numbers. you can use anything and create a mathematical system out of it so what makes it a mathematical system and what makes these systems be able to function despite being you know very perhaps strange to us is that logic kind of takes over. We, we put in these parameters, we put in these elements, and then logic just kind of flows and makes it happen however it happens. And that's what math is. Excuse me. Oh, sorry. So anyway, I was just contemplating that logic is because it just is it's not something that humans created it's something that we acknowledge and it's present in everything i mean it seems to be um and that's why math is such a powerful tool is because the models that we use in math, the systems that we use in math. I mean, these are things that express themselves also in the real world, not in such a simple way that we might think of as like pure or clean, but, but it's everywhere. It's everywhere. And logic works, you know, it just inherently does. And in a way that no human system could ever could it's just there it's just the way of things and seeing this the the beauty the elegance of the way that these logical systems exist the complexity and the beauty and the perfection of them in a moment I was just struck. I just knew that what, however these things came to be, it was from God. And I knew that without a, a predetermined idea of, you know, really who I thought God was. It, it just occurred to me that God is this ultimate truth that everything flows from that underpins existence, like that there is a truth beyond what humans can ever fully grasp. That is because how else could there be this, this perfect and this elegant logic if there isn't some underlying truth? I don't know if I'm expressing this well. But yeah. So I so in that moment, I knew a number of things suddenly. 
I knew that whatever this absolute truth was, that's what people call God. And that I also knew, and this I can't explain, um, but I knew that God was love. God is love. That this truth is also love, and this truth is also just sort of the, the ultimate wisdom. But again, I, I didn't, I didn't have this conception of that, you know, beyond that, that like God was like this or God was like that or what God looks like or, or anything like that. It was just like, well, you know, this exists and it is called God. That's what people are referring to maybe imperfectly. And maybe they don't, we all have imperfect understandings of this stuff because n nobody can really fully just like know the whole truth, right? Know the full depth and breadth and, and wholeness of the truth. That's just not something a person can do. <laughs> We're too limited, but, but that's what people are getting at. Is this, is this ineffable -ness? And so I had this very abstract concept of God at that point. And I also, again, I, it seemed clear to me and it obviously it still seems clear to me that like I've been saying, it's not something a, a human can just get to that. You can just, okay, now I've come to God and it's, you know, I've got it all figured out now, you know, no, that's never going to happen because you can always go deeper. This is, this is this infinitely, this, this infinite deep truth that's so beyond us, you know? Um, but I did believe, and I do believe that you can get closer or farther away to living this truth, to being dwelling in this truth, to um, serving the truth, you know? Um, it's, it's relative, but, you, but it does matter you can get closer or farther away. Like I, I, I pictured this in my mind as an asymptote. Um, if you know what an asymptote is, it's, it's, you know, especially when it's like, you know, when a function, it can't, it can't quite, it can't be at that point. You can't get to that point on that function. It goes off into infinity, but you can travel that path going off into infinity and get closer and closer and closer and closer. And that's the path. That's what I wanted to do. I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I knew that that meant, you know, if I didn't, if I don't know what the truth is, then in order to get closer to the truth, I need to be in principle willing to accept that it might be something that's horrifying or uncomfortable or um, inconvenient for me. That it might be very different from what I want to believe. You know, that that's part of that. And I think that's that's something that I see in people who, you know, are, are genuine skeptics and not skeptics as in, you know, they're just skeptical of everything that's not that that's convenient for them to be skeptical about. I mean, the, the real spirit of a skeptic is, I think, to be willing to examine yourself and to try to see the truth for what it is, even and even accepting that at any given moment, you won't. <laughs> the best you can hope for is to get a little closer. So that's the journey I set out on at that point. And I, I also, along with all this, I also had this faith at that point that, and this is something that Kat um, also expressed too, which I think is interesting, um, that, well, she, didn't, she, you didn't express it quite in this way, but, um, you know, I was, I was coming off of the premise that I did believe in God already. And so I was... I believed that in that moment as well, that as long as I did my best to walk that path, that I would 
make progress, <laughs> essentially, um, that, that God would help me as long as I had that genuine desire. Um, and, you know, lo and behold, that's, that's in the, that's in the Bible. I can't remember where I'm not like a Bible memorizer person, but I think it's in the Psalms. Anyway, <sighs> sorry, it's the breathing. So yeah, um, so that's the that's the short story. <laughs> that's how I came to believe in God. The story as to how I became a Christian specifically, I mean, that was another almost 20 years of, um, well, I guess more like 15 years of, of a journey um, that took me to a lot of different places. And I learned a lot along the way. And I have a lot to say about all of that, but, um, it would be a really long video. <laughs> um, but suffice to say, um, you know, I feel in a way I've never felt before in any of the practices that I've engaged in that I've found my home as a Christian. Um, and that this is, this is what, I've been seeking. Um, so yeah, I'll leave it at that for now. Uh, I hope this is uh, useful to get another, just another perspective. I'm not trying to, you know, obviously this, this isn't an attempt to convince you of something, um, but just, I thought your perspective was interesting and even though the, um, the, a lot of this, the sort of outward things like how we were raised and what, what our relationships with religion and Christianity and God have been like, um, I feel like our inner desires and our attempts to grapple with the truth have been in a way very similar. So, um, yeah, I hope, I don't know. Yeah. I hope it's good. You like it, whatever. <laughs> and it's a uh, good to uh, give you some content because it's a, uh, I've kind of felt like I've been friends with you for a few years, but it's kind of a one way relationship. So <laughs> anyway, I, uh, yeah, <laughs> uh, have a good time. Good luck with everything. Be well.